Thank you for being here. Uh, Julia Kramer is our uh, guest this week, and so particularly tonight, giving us a talk, as you can see, on embedding equity in human-centered design. Um, I think many of you know that design is the way that we are seeing how we're connecting engineering and society. It's the way that we're connecting research and practice. It's kind of putting a lot of what we teach in the classroom into practice on the ground. That's kind of what we're looking for in the humanitarian engineering program. It's why we, um, and engineering design and society more broadly, why we want to be bringing somebody like Julia in to talk with us about how we do that in practice. What does this look like and what are some experiences that people have had, really excellent experiences and a lot of wisdom to offer um, in order for us to do our jobs better, really. And so jobs in the future for many of you. When you're graduating from here, you technically have a, you're an engineer. Um, if that makes you uncomfortable, stay in school or something. And then, yeah, think about it. Um, and so how do we get out there and, and go do this better? Um, and so I just like to, you know, what Juan did on, on Tuesday, which I think was great, is a little bit about, I've got to spend a lot of time with Julia um, over the past few days. Um, sorry. <laughs> and I think that a um, number of things that I've learned about her and that I hope to learn more when we hang out in Denver a bit in the morning tomorrow, um, but just that she's also a learner and somebody who's really um, excited and passionate about these experiences that she's had and where they can lead people in the future. Um, and really providing a platform for people to take, in, uh, take what, they, what they like and use what they like, uh, but also being really humble about it at the same time. So uh, through her talks and everything else that we've kind of learned about her this week, she's doing some amazing, amazing work. And those of you who I've spent time with, you know that one of the things that I'm most passionate about is um, being humble and having humility in our design and as engineers. And uh, Julia's just been one of these people that does this better than any, anybody else so far that I've seen. Uh, and I think she's going to talk a little bit about more of her work. But um, yeah, just, just know that this is kind of the kind of person that we are hoping to have coming out of this program, but also those engineers that are actually doing things on the ground in the future. Um, so yeah, with that, I think, Julia, you're going to talk more about your bio a little bit and what you're doing um, here? Sure. In this one? I, I will. Yeah, okay. I wasn't going to. I'll go on. Mechanical Engineering, PhD student at yeah. Berkeley, part of the Development Engineering Program um, that's there as a, a minor in the PhD yeah, as a, it's a de development engineering minor um, while doing a PhD in mechanical engineering. If any of you are, are, how many mechanical engineers in here? Yeah, usually half of every room. All right. <laughs> um, some of the some of the stuff about equity doesn't come up that much in the classroom, and so trying to figure out the ways that we navigate these spaces while being in traditional structures, how do we value what we're doing, uh, you know, value ourselves, and be excited and passionate about what we're doing all the time. Um, in ways that, because uh, that's how we can make ourselves do this, make ourselves working in this in more sustainable ways, is being motivated constantly every day. So I'll let you go here, get off the stage, and thank you so much for being here. Cool. Give you a little, little welcome round of applause. Well, as per usual, Greg is giving me a gratuitous introduction, so I do want to thank Greg uh, especially for being such a wonderful host and for everyone else who I've gotten a chance to talk with and those who I haven't. Um, thank you for being here, and I'm really excited to chat with you. I'm excited that, you know, it's a Thursday night at 5 and we're all in the library, so <laughs> thank you for being here. Um, I want to try to keep this loose. I have slides, but please, like, throw up a hand, interrupt me. Um, don't heckle me too much because I'll get sidetracked, but um, feel free to ask me questions. I would love to like engage in this a bit more informally. Um, and so with that, I will kind of say, here are the three major questions that I'm going to try to answer in this talk, or at least talk about how I've been thinking about them. So one, what is human-centered design and why do we need it? Um, two, why is human-centered design on its own not enough? And then three, what can we do to make human-centered design better? And so these are really core of what I'm hearing echoed in the Humanitarian Engineering Program. And I know Greg and Juan talk about design as that bridge between engineering and society. Um, so hopefully some of those threads will come through as well uh, and talk about how I'm also conveying design in that way. So first, what is human-centered design? Who's heard that term? that hasn't heard one of my talks yet today. Yeah, cool, still, still common, yeah. Um, so I also like to kind of back out, like what do I even mean by design and who are designers? 
And so I like the vaguest definition possible is that design is the act of creatively addressing problems and opportunities. So it's everything from product design, the things we interact with every day. You know, this podium was designed, this clicker was designed, it's the engineering design, mechanical engineering is gears and stuff. Electrical engineering might be more hardware and software, that kind of thing. But it's also urban design, and it's activism. It's the way that we design social movements. It's the way that we try to understand how is the world changing, and how can we kind of design ourselves into that next phase. And so I'm a designer of all of those kind of aspects of design. I was trained in engineering design. I did my undergrad at University of Michigan, um, which has the same block M as here, so I feel right at home. It's even built into the mountain up there. Um, side note that I was going to make a bad joke earlier. This is called embedding, so I was going to put the little block M in a bed, but I was like, that's not going to translate. <laughs> anyway, um, and like Greg said, I'm at um, UC Berkeley right now getting my PhD in mechanical engineering, so mechanical all the way through, but my mindset around kind of engineering and design has shifted. And so when I started, especially, you know, my first couple classes, the technical classes, I was taught this um, kind of standard engineering problem-solving approach that seemed to carry through whether it was thermo, fluids, statics, dynamics. It seemed to work that, you know, I receive a problem that was in this problem set that I'd be doing like 10 problems every week for every class that I was in. Write down what do I know about the context that's already given to me, what are the theoretical constants that are already given, what are the assumptions that are embedded in the way the problem is framed and what are my assumptions about the problem based on what I already know? What equations am I going to use? And then how am I just going to solve for what's unknown? So pretty flexible, right? This kind of reads true of most of the classes I've taken and holds true depending on just what the different equations are and the different constants we know. That was the theme of all of my technical undergrad is teaching those different pieces of it. But we're not given the contextual factors to consider. And moreover, we're not being trained on how to actually do that. I see Juan throwing up his arms because I know that's the subject of his book. And I think that's a great step of like, what are those human factors in this problem? But also, how do we figure out those human factors for ourselves? And how do we go out into the world and understand what are the bigger contexts that these problems are living in? Not just the things that are uh, technical professors give to us and say this is the problem, solve it. How do we even figure out what is the right problem to, to solve? So we're problem solvers, we're being trained as problem solvers who only have really one way to solve problems and we look for problems that we know how to solve. So kind of the classic analogy of we're hammers searching for nails and everything looks like a nail when you're a hammer. But the complex social problems of our world aren't solvable with our methods. And so complex social problems, I'm going to condense that into the framing of what's called wicked problems. And so this was an idea originally posed in a 1973 paper that was actually about urban planning. Um, but I can, I'm going to explore later how that really inspired a lot of design aspects. But to illustrate what a wicked problem is, let's take the example of healthcare. So one idea of a wicked problem is that there's no definite formulation of what the problem is. So in the healthcare example, you could say 17 different ways the problem of healthcare is X, the problem of healthcare is Y, Z, you know, all 26 letters of the alphabet. Um, and all of those would be correct. There's no one way that we're saying the problem of healthcare is this and that's it. Another facet, wicked problems have no stopping rule. So yeah, you can pose solutions to it, but there's never one solution that all of a sudden it's not a problem anymore. So with healthcare, yes, there are aspects that you can make healthcare better, but you've never solved healthcare. Uh, every solution's a one-shot operation, and so every attempt counts significantly. So especially in healthcare, if you put something out in the world that's trying to solve someone's life, you can't really, you don't have the opportunity to fail if you're, what you're doing is not something that you have much agency of trial and error and every shot counts. And so you have to take that into consideration when you put something out into the world. Every wicked problem is essentially unique. You know, the problems of healthcare are not the same as the problems of, you know, designing the podium for that other example. Um, or it's not the same as the problems of poverty in the world. There are different and unique considerations of every wicked problem. 
And lastly, every wicked problem can be considered a symptom of another problem, and then that always kind of circles back into itself. So healthcare, at its root, maybe is a problem of poverty, but then poverty is exacerbated by issues of healthcare. So it's very circuitous in that there's no like linear cause and effect so that we can just solve the cause and all the effects are fixed. That's not really how it works. I should say I only picked about five of the characteristics of wicked problems. In the paper there are ten, um, so you should check those out. So some other ideas of wicked problems that follow this are things like climate change or global hunger or homelessness. These big, complex, seemingly intractable problems that follow all these things. What are some other examples of wicked problems that is not one of the four I've listed up there? Why faculty don't show up to talks? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's, uh, let's abstract that a little. Uh, absenteeism. Yeah. It's definitely an issue. <laughs> Infrastructure. Infrastructure. Totally. Yeah. Especially the, coming from the city planners. That's what they were talking about is infrastructure. What else? Inequality. Yeah, just yeah. like global inequality. I'm so much, so happy you mentioned that word because I'm going to come back to inequality. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what do we do? Yeah, this is a little spoiler alert there. <laughs> um, so what do we do? We're engineers. We know how to solve engineering problems, but the big problems that we might care about aren't solvable with engineering methods. So what do we do? Well, human-centered design, um, which I might slip up and use the acronym. I'm going to try to avoid that HCD, um, is a start to that. And so a definition I like of using, or of HCD, is that it's an approach to understanding stakeholder needs and desires towards the creation of a novel intervention of value. So it's something that is based on this understanding of what the needs are, what the context is, and an attempt to create something valuable to address those needs in that context. And so from the IDEO Human Centered Design Toolkit, they, it's, uh, a bit of a simplification, but it kind of falls at the intersection of something being technically feasible, desirable by humans, and then viable in the real world. And the good news is we know how to do the technical feasibility. That's where our engineering background comes in, right? We know how to make something work, whether it's, you know, how to make a pump that is going to pump water from point A to point B, or making a set of gears that isn't going to be super loud when my car is driving down the road. We know how to do technical feasibility. But what the unique part of human-centered design as that bridge from engineers to wicked problems is the desirability and the viability. And so this is where I'm getting into a little like design history. Um, design thinking and human-centered design were inspired by this original paper that Horst Riddle and Melvin Weber wrote way back in 1973. So in 1973, they wrote this paper framing what wicked problems are. 15 years, is that 14 years later, Peter Rowe, who was in the design department at MIT, wrote a book called Design Thinking, which was really like the first popularization of that phrase. Design thinking, there is like a subtle difference between design thinking and human-centered design, but for this purpose, I'm just going to consider them synonymous. Um, with Richard Buchanan then, another 15 years later, five years later, geez, math, um, wrote a paper called Wicked Problems in Design Thinking. So really bringing back this framing that the problems that design thinking is good at addressing are these wicked problems that we thought of way back when. My timeline's a little bit out of order, but then IDEO was founded in 1991. I don't exactly know when they started using this phrasing, but it's what's currently on their about page relating design thinking to human-centered design, saying that design thinking is a human-centered approach. So. I put it after 1992 because I'm pretty sure it wasn't their initial mission statement, but somewhere in that line. And then now the way we talk about design thinking and human-centered design is very much based on the um, tactics and the methods of IDEO, of MIT, of Stanford's D school. But what my advisor always wants me to say is that these guys were actually Berkeley professors. So Berkeley may have may or may not have been the birthplace of design thinking. So Go you all should take that with you. <laughs> Go I Bears. You now. You're, you're there, so you, they're, they're good. Yep, yep. <laughs> um, cool. All right. What is human-centered design? Five general phases going through understanding research. That's that stakeholder needs, context, all that stuff. Making sense of all that research through an analysis process. 
using your kind of understanding of the problem to then inform some potential ideas that you're generating, building those solutions into more like tangible things that you can start testing with people and communicating throughout that process. But to make it even a bit more simplified, it's basically this three-step approach. You build empathy by learning from your users, you generate ideas and you build solutions, and then you test and you iterate until they work. So going back to that Venn diagram, we got desirability, the ideas and solutions kind of that in between, and then we've got viability. Can I ask you a quick question? Please. Can you go back one more? And these are, so you're saying phases, are these happening simultaneously, and is this an order? Um, how do you think about it, and how do you talk about it? Yeah, so I use the word phase instead of like steps or something like that to try to imply that they all could be happening all at once. They could happen out of order. What actually pretty often happens is you might already have a technology in the world and you're trying to redesign it. So you might already start with this building component and then you collect research on it. There does tend to be some order of like, you have to have something to analyze. So analysis after research. But then once you analyze, you might go back into your research. You might just start coming up with ideas, building them, and then realizing like, oh wait, we don't know the problem at all. So now we're gonna go back to that beginning. Okay. Um, and communication is definitely happening throughout all of it. It's how you communicate with your clients, your stakeholders, your team members, um, with yourself, all that stuff is wrapped in there. Cool. So often this works really well. So to pull another example from IDEO, Tom Kelly, who's one of the founding brothers of IDEO, shares this story about how they were tasked with the idea of redesigning the child's toothbrush. And so back in the day, the child's toothbrush used to look like this. They were just an adult toothbrush, but scaled down, right? Makes sense. Littler hands, littler teeth, littler toothbrush. But they were, uh, I think they were contracted by Oral-B to do this work. And what they did was they went out and observed kids brushing their teeth. They observed parents who were having to help their kids, you know, put the toothbrush on the, toothpaste on the toothbrush, seeing all the pain points as part of that process. And what they ended up seeing was that even though it kind of makes sense that we should have a thin toothbrush for a little hand, it was actually easier for kids to grip if the toothbrush was thicker. So that's why what most of the kids' toothbrushes we see now have that chubbier handle, because even though it's maybe counterintuitive, but little our hands actually work better with a bigger brush. Um, and so that's kind of an example of when this process works really well, of seeing some unknown needs that we might not have noticed if we just tried to reason our way through it, but actually going out and seeing how people are interacting with, in this case, a toothbrush led us to have an understanding of the problem in a different way. But to part two of my conversation. Um, Can you go back? Yeah. I just want to share a joke. Please. <laughs> we, um, we, we hired a couple of years ago uh, uh, a designer uh -huh. from IDEO who uh, came to humanitarian engineering and said this very sentence in his um, job interview. Uh -huh. If I design another toothbrush, I am going to die. <laughs> <laughs> there. Totally fair. <laughs> Yeah, so maybe we've reached uh, design saturation yeah. at that point, yeah. Although there is some new electric toothbrush, have you all heard of this? That's like, I don't know, it's part of this direct-to-consumer movement, but quick, yeah, yeah, that's it. Ah, uh, gotcha, yeah. Anyway, sidebar into oral health, my mom is a dental hygienist, so this is near and dear to my heart. <laughs> um, cool, so human-centered design works, sometimes it works really well, but why is it on its own not enough, especially when we're thinking about wicked problems? And so when we're trying to address problems in, of inequity, I'm posing to you that human-centered design is not enough. But why? Well, wicked problems are largely problems of equity, and this Liz is where we're getting back to inequality. So what's the difference between equality and equity? Yeah. Uh, equality is giving everyone the same thing, and equity is giving people what they need to reach the same level of, like, social justice or whatever it is. Totally. You might say it's giving everyone a pair of shoes versus giving everyone a pair of shoes that fits. <laughs> uh, back to the healthcare example. Equality in healthcare is providing the same drugs, the same medical devices, the same treatments for everyone. Equity is providing uniquely developed 
drugs, medical devices, and treatments for unique groups of people. And so this has been a particular issue in women's health, for example. So a lot of the clinical trials of, of old drugs were only tested on men, and we don't know how they work on women. Um, and so previously they may have just kind of pushed out, like, they'll work for everyone. We did our clinical trials, statistical ability, all that. But there's a recognition that different people react in different ways. So an equitable approach to health would be taking a particular view of looking, if we're trying to design for women, we have to talk to women. <laughs> yeah. So going into your circles of viability, I think some people think equality is more fair, though, mm -hmm. because it's a standard. Everybody totally. can agree on it. So what do you think of fairness in terms of viability of, when you talk about these two? What do so societies yeah. actually respond when you try to push to equity, which people inherently yeah. do believe is more right, yeah. but can't viability-wise get totally. behind it? So I always try to reframe the fairness about giving people the same thing and trying to be fairness about allowing people to have the same opportunities. And so that might mean giving more marginalized groups of people different things or more things or less things so that it's instead of what we're kind of providing at that base level, it's what we're allowing them to reach. But to your point, you know, this is still a fairly radical mm -hmm. idea. Um, and we can talk more at the end about like the challenges of this approach. Yeah. Um, but I do think one of the challenges is the reticence to even consider that like equitable opportunity might be the, the more fair goal. So if we're applying this kind of reductive three-step process to a wicked problem like healthcare, what could possibly go wrong? Which users are you talking to to build empathy? Totally. Yeah. That goes back to like the kind of the women and are you talking with women if you're designing for women? Are you talking with children if you're designing for children? Yeah, that matters. I have thoughts. Yeah. How do you test and iterate when you're working with human lives? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, totally. Experts in healthcare, maybe not feel like they should be questioned on doing things. Yeah. In a new way? Totally. That's one of the hills that I'm going to die on eventually, is <laughs> rethinking the notions of expertise. Mm -hmm. Who's an expert? And in a sense, we're all experts in the way that we're experts of our own lived experience. But how do we get technical experts to kind of recognize that lived experience expertise of people? Totally. Yeah, so some other thoughts too. So how do we even understand health? What's the broader like historical, political context around healthcare? Why is health inequitable in the first place? And how do we start thinking about root causes in order to address problems, but also understanding that the root causes kind of reinforce health and health reinforces the root causes, like I was saying with poverty and health. And then to your point, yeah, we can't really afford to fail when we're talking about people's lives. There is some testing that we can probably do in a not as risky situation, but how do we figure out what those less risky situations look, at, look like? And so, I always love throwing in an Einstein quote. Um, problems can't be solved at the same level of thinking that created them. And so, if we're trying, oops, if we're trying to solve problems of equity, we have to explicitly think about equity. We can't just be relying on the status quo because that's exactly why these problems exist in the first place. And so going back, I already posed, you know, design thinking and human-centered design were inspired by wicked problems, but in implementation, they have not gone far enough to address those wicked problems themselves. And so, I guess to, to summarize that, I had already said that, to solve problems of inequity, we need to explicitly think about equity. I'm gonna get that tattooed across my chest. <laughs> so that leads to then part three of the talk. I'm gonna do that in time. What can we do to make human-centered design better? How can we make it more equitable? I'm posing that there are two key pieces, certainly not at the, um, risk of saying that nothing else is needed in this formula, but at least these two key areas from some work I've done that shows me that we need to engage in co-design and we have to think and act diplomatically. So that first one, engage in co-design. So how many of you have heard of participatory co-design? Is that like a term that makes, cool, cool, couple, yeah. So I think it's the, the general premise is that you're trying to design with people as opposed to designing for people. 
But I like this ladder from a paper from 2013 about co-design that's talking about the different levels of like stakeholder engagement. At the worst level, it's denigration. You're actively putting those down who you're trying to serve. Um, what HCD tends to be is learning from. We go out in the field, we interview, we observe. They teach us something about their lives and we don't necessarily reciprocate. The goal of participatory co-design at the top level is learning as one. And so what that means is not only are you learning from the people you're working with, but they are also getting the chance to work, learn from you. So in, you know, in the case of design, it might be I'm going off and talking with midwives. I learn about their experience, but they also learn from mine. Um, they learn more about design. They might learn some tools that then they could use in their own lives. And the goal of learning with one that's a bit aspirational and the difference between learning together is it erases that sort of power dynamic and hierarchy between I'm the person who stepped in and said we're going to design together. It's more of a bi-directional approach. So that's kind of the goal of participatory co-design. And so to illustrate this, I'm going to talk about a project that some of you have already heard a lot about. Um, a project I worked on in Ghana with midwives started in 2013 called Visualize. And so the goal at the top level of this project was to educate midwives in Ghana how to screen for cervical cancer. And so what we ended up building, I'll just kind of go cut straight to the, the point, is we had built this training model that allows midwives in Ghana how, uh, to practice cervical cancer screening before they actually go out and see real patients. Um, so they can use this simulated vagina, they use photos of what the cervix looks like before and after cervical cancer screening, and they use that to make a diagnosis of is the um, simulated patient here precancerous or not. And so this was informed by an eight week trip, eight week trip I took to Ghana, um, where we saw that 275,000 women die of cervical cancer every year, and 80% of those deaths are occurring in low and lower middle income countries. More specific to Ghana, it's the number one cause of cancerous death in women, but less than 5% of women have ever been screened. So there's this huge barrier between cervical cancer screening pretty much avoids all instances of cervical cancer death, but cervical cancer screening isn't being done. And so people are dying pretty needlessly of this avoidable disease. And so the three kind of key reasons that we pin that down to is that there isn't um, enough like traditional infrastructure that we need as we have in the US, which is labs and lab technicians and good um, kind of communication between doctor and patient as they're trying to get their results for their test back. There's also not enough awareness of cervical cancer. Here, I, at least when I grew up, that was like as soon as I reached reproductive age, my doctor was like, okay, you're gonna come and get your pap smear at age, I think 25, they said. And so then last year, you know, go off to the hospital, go get my pap smear. It was like drilled in me from a very young age. Um, that wasn't the case in Ghana. And then while there are trained healthcare providers in almost all other aspects of OBGYN health in Ghana, they weren't being trained on how to do cervical cancer screening. Um, and so that's kind of how we carved out our little niche of creating educational techniques for healthcare providers. And so we, dis we personally did not discover, but we found in the literature this alternative screening method to pap smear called visual inspection with acetic acid which a pap smear works that you take uh, cells from a patient, put them on a little lab slide, send that off to the lab. This works that in one visit, you can screen the patient, apply vinegar to, simple table vinegar to a patient's cervix, and if there are any precancerous cells, they show up as white lesions that the midwife can see with the naked eye. So right in the same procedure, you're able to see whether or not that patient is precancerous or not. You don't have to wait to go send those results off to a lab. And then you can communicate those results back to her in the same visit. And if she is precancerous, you can freeze off those cells using cryotherapy or some, some other way, like excise them from her so that they never end up growing into cancer. So super inspiring. We're like, this seems ready-made for Ghana. Um, but again, there was an issue of education. And so that is why 
we started framing our idea around how can we support increased training and awareness of VIA in Ghana. I have a question. Yeah. Um, as far as why we don't do that, like here, why we even have to do, you know what I mean? Like, I was just wondering, like, do they have to go back and go to, a, like, another doctor or something after? So, there are, there's a lot of, like, other reasons and stuff in here. So the pap smear is marginally better than VIA. Um, in terms of, like, VIA has a higher false positive rate than pap smear does, which in healthcare at least, that's, that's the better one to have. You'd rather, like, catch people who might not be positive than telling people that they're negative and sending them home. Um, so it's, in that sense, that's, like, the reason a lot of doctors here told us not yeah, we don't do VIA. But there's also, I think, this like weird hierarchy of it's not technical, you know, it doesn't use our microscope, so we can't do it. Um, so there is some simplification thing that was going on. Um, but the past like five years since we've been working on this, there's another method called colposcopy that is basically the same as VIA, but instead of looking with your naked eye at the patient's cervix, you look with like a super magnified um, goggles. So it's the same screen and treat idea, um, but you can see much deeper into the patient's cervix um, and get a much better diagnosis. So doctors are starting to do that a bit more as well in the U.S. Um, and they're also pairing pap smears with uh, HPV DNA testing. So in that, that's a way of seeing, so HPV causes like 99% of all cervical cancer. So they can also, they can see, do you have precancer cells right now? And also, do you have HPV, which is gonna make you more likely to have cervical cancer in the future? So all those kinds of like more sophisticated techniques have taken off here, um, which is part of why I don't think they've embraced the more simplified version. Okay. Yeah. So this gets into like, there's multiple ways to deal with this type of cancer. Yep, yep. So you're looking at just trying to identify, but then what is the ability once it is identified to actually remove, or yep. do you just treat with a HPV vaccine? You know, why did you, why did you go towards doing screenings? What led you totally. to that? Yeah. So uh, some different like approaches we could have taken would be trying to build awareness for HPV vaccinations and making sure that all young women in Ghana were getting. Um, vaccinated, which would mean they would never get HPV, which would mean they would never get cervical cancer. The reason we chose not to do that is there were a lot of other international organizations trying to push that forward. Um, and so it was a bit of a crowded space already. And the, pet, or the HPV vaccine tends to be given to ch um, women when they're about 12 years old, at least like that's the recommended age. So if we vaccinated all 12 year old women, that's awesome, but that also means that there's, you know, like a 60-year frame of women who are above 12 who, because they're post-reproductive age um, and they're already sexually active, they're not good candidates for the HPV vaccine, um, and so what do we do for them? So we are kind of trying to address that little middle gap of people who might be too old to get the HPV vaccine but are still totally at risk of developing it. Um, and then the reason we chose to do screen or um, education for this approach is because it was pretty low hanging fruit. We wanted to do something that could have an impact right away. I'm under no illusions that like in 20 years, VIA is gonna be the gold standard. I think it's again, kind of just a stopgap, but it can work right now with a fairly um, like less coordinated push than it would take to get like global coordination on doing an HPV vaccine campaign or something like that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Cool. Cool. So our general theory um, is that if we put out these box trainers and curriculum into schools, midwifery students become proficient in VIA, midwives go out and perform more VIAs, they screen more women, more women don't get cervical cancer and don't die. That's kind of our theory. You'll probably notice that I haven't mentioned co-design once, and I've always been talking about me and my design team and what we did. This, I should say, our project started as our opportunity to learn about HCD. And in the past five years that I've been working on it, it has slowly been morphing into a co-design project with midwives, midwifery students, and midwifery instructors. 
but the specific piece that we're trying to co-design, I, you know, in hindsight, I wish we could have done the entire device development as a co-design project. But oops, the part that we're co-designing now is the development of that curriculum. So I, like I said, I'm trained in engineering design. I love education. I love public health. But I'm not trained in developing healthcare education tools. And so on one of our more, uh, I think it was our 2014 trip, we connected with <coughs> some midwives who are the foremost, you know, experts in VIA in Ghana. And they, as part of just like out of the goodness of their hearts and that, uh, as something totally out of what they get paid to do, they go out and train more midwives on how to screen for cervical cancer. So we started talking with them, seeing uh, it was kind of selfish, just like, what do you think of our device? How can we improve it? The traditional HCV stuff. But what we ended up finding is that for this thing to even be useful, it has to be embedded within some greater curriculum that's teaching people on how to use the device, how to even talk about cervical cancer with patients, how to wrap it into a more holistic framework of health and women's health care. And so that, all of that has been very much a co-design process, learning from how they're already teaching midwives and then trying to pair our device with that so that when we are going out and instructing midwifery students on how to do VIA, that has all been a very much um, co-designed process. Keep going backwards. And so that's what some of these um, training sessions have looked like. So this is one of those um, kind of master midwife trainers who we were talking with to develop the curriculum. And she's using an older version of our device, because um, I think that was our 2014 trip, um, to teach midwives on how to do this. And so I was just sitting in the front of the class just kind of taking photos of how people were using it. But the actual instruction of the thing was very much developed in partnership. Um, and a couple other examples here of other training sessions we've done over the past, I guess, three, three and a half years. So where we struggle with co-design, well, the one thing I didn't put on here is that we didn't do it for a while, so that wasn't good. Um, <laughs> there's also like, once we actually tried doing it, we face this big challenge. We're working across a literal ocean, and then now I'm in California, so I'm working across all of the United States and then an ocean. So there's a lot of time issues. There's a lot of communication issues. Um, people in Ghana are super communica communicative by phone. Um, but we almost never overlap in times in terms of like when I'm awake and when they're awake. Um, I go to bed late, wake up, or I go to bed late, wake up late. They're the total opposite, and then add in nine hours. We almost never have a chance to talk. There are also barriers of funding. So I, as a U.S. citizen and as a graduate student, have a lot of access to funding. But that kind of reinforces the power dynamic of, I'm the one driving this forward, it's my funding, and I'm just including you in the process. So there's you know, weird hierarchies of who's able to apply for funding based on citizenship that is playing into this broader um, issue of like the US being the ones giving out funds, as opposed to it being a more global thing. Um, and then, like I guess the last point, are we just doing co-design in name or are we actually embedding it into our practices has been like a constant checks and balances that we've had to go through. And so how are we working to overcome these point by point? So we're starting to establish like actual formal partnerships on the ground. So writing up like memorandums of understanding that uh, have an explicit kind of agreement, what they expect from us and what we expect from them in partnership, just as a way to have common language that we're sharing around, are we both considering this a partnership, um, or is it just on our end? Can I ask you about that real quick? Please, yeah. Is that a legal document, or is this sort of just an agreement that you have so that yeah. you have something to talk Right now, not legally binding. Right. Part of that, and I could get into more of the logistics of it, this organization is not an NGO. I'm relying upon UC Berkeley's NGO status for all the grants I'm applying for. When I graduate, uh, we'll have to like consider, is it a formal organization? And then at which point, contracts will be a bit more of a legal question. But for now, it's more just a shared document of understanding. Yeah. Um, to the second point, where outside of the US can we apply for funding? And so one of the folks who we just applied for a grant for, um, they found an organization called ACT Foundation um, I'm not sure where they're headquartered, but it was open to anyone to apply to. And they initiated the granting process and 
asked us for a letter of support, whereas usually it's been the opposite. So it's kind of that first example of us being, you know, their partners as opposed to them being ours. Uh, and then how do we check ourselves <laughs> before we wreck ourselves? Um, <laughs> continually reflecting on what we're doing. And there, you know, there's no formula to this, but every time I'm trying to, to put a trip together, making sure that I'm not just stopping by just to say hello, but it's really about trying to engage in this like mutual shared agenda of pushing this program forward um, and seeing what our stated goals are and do our processes align with that. I wish I had like a better formulaic answer to that, but I don't think there is one. So to kind of abstract a level higher, how is this framework applicable to other types of programs? Um, so some takeaway points from this I would say is invite co-designers, but also allow yourself to be invited in. So keep your ears to the ground of seeing what are all the different things going on. Don't assume that everyone you ask is going to be psyched to work with you, but also just make yourself available and put it out there that you are interested in that partnership and folks who need maybe an engineer or a designer should feel as comfortable asking you for permission as you are asking them for permission. Um, figure out what allows you to do your work and then how can you create access for your co-designers to do that work as well. So funding being kind of that example again, that's a huge privilege I have being a US citizen. So how can I start to create access for my co-designers to also access funding? What are the kind of the barriers that I can work to tear down from within that would allow more space for others? Uh, and to the third point of that checks and balances, just practicing reflexivity, um, which is from you know educational curriculum, but it's basically just the idea of reflecting and then acting on your reflections. Yes. So these principles of, of, of engaging in co-design, um, are you guys figuring it out? I mean, do these come from you? Do these come from you in conversations with other co-designers who are tackling other wicked problems? Well, where is this coming from? Yeah, so I mean, these three are meant to be, oops, um, just abstractions of these very tactical ways that we're overcoming our struggles. This, uh, again, is not, um, what am I trying to say? It's not everything. I'm sure there are other things that we've missed, and I have not yet started having like a more research-oriented agenda around looking at other principles of co-design. I just put this together for the purposes of the talk and thinking, what are the specific things we've struggled, how do we overcome it, and then how do those relate to some broader takeaway principles? All right, I'm gonna take a breath. Um, the second point, let me get some water. Um, the second way of embedding equity in human-centered design that I'm proposing is to think and act diplomatically. And so what does diplomatic mean? So again, vague definitions are my jam. So it's to act tactfully and sensitively, and to act specifically sensitively towards power dynamics, understanding who has kind of the ability to achieve desired outcomes, who doesn't have that ability, what are the power dynamics of you being a designer, what historical forces have shaped that power, all that fun stuff that's super fun to think about. And then the second, understanding the different landscape of actors, who are the people you're interacting with, and what are their various interests. Um, so who are you know, the institutions that are represented? The US is one, um, Berkeley is one. The idea that we're calling ourselves an organization means that we're posing ourselves as an institution. But what are the other institutions kind of at play, and what are their motivations? I'm trying to understand that. And so the story, I guess, to illustrate this point has been a more recent project. I started with seven, or I guess at the time, three other people um, called Reflex Design Collective. And our goal here, more domestically focused, is to use design tools to address social justice issues in the Bay Area. Um, and so we're trying to be intentionality about bringing diplomatic and political thinking into design itself. So what that looks like is we've got this very kind of multidisciplinary group of people, a couple engineers, two students, two city planners, um, 
a service designer and like a finance person, um, all working together and thinking what are kind of the roots of these wicked problems and how can we use human-centered design to address those. And so we're kind of, there's three main things that we do. We're advisors for other kind of politically minded design groups. Um, we're field builders and thinking like, what does this practice of equity design look like? Um, and the most well-developed section we have is facilitating equitable design processes. So what that facilitation piece looks like, um, there's a lot of like threes in this presentation I'm realizing, um, which isn't necessarily intentional, so apologies for that. Um, we facilitated design for healing, design for internal group dynamics, and design for between group dynamics. So just super quick examples of what those have each looked like. So at last year's Empowering Women of Color conference at Berkeley, um, we did a two-hour design session on giving participants tools to understand what are kind of the traumas that they're dealing with in their daily lives, where did those traumas come from, and how might they like design a solution to take back some of the agency and healing themselves in the process. And so this was super cool. It was kind of a, a prototype at the time, but so we got everything from I'm going to make like a self-care checklist to I'm going to... I, someone had designed a conversation that they were going to have with their dad who they had had historical trauma with. Um, so what are kind of the different ways that folks are envisioning that they've been traumatized and then how can they work to solve those um, traumatic instances? Uh, internal group dynamics. So we did a uh, day-long workshop at UC Davis in their environmental health sciences department which was a cool program that they had a bunch of academic environmental scientists um, and they had a bunch of environment focused NGOs in the Central Valley in California. But the issue they were having, or I guess I should say the goal of the program was to have NGOs give scientific research projects to the researchers, the researchers to go out like collect data, maybe it's you know water quality in this one particular thing, or like water quality impacts of using a particular kind of fertilizer, and then communicate those results back to the NGOs, and then they can inform their um, organizational decisions based on that. But the issues that they were having and why, why they came to us is that the NGOs were feeling very stuck in this power dynamic of the um, academics acting like they knew what was right and acting like they knew what research questions the NGOs should be asking. And so the NGOs not even necessarily getting the chance to say, no, this is what like the people who we represent are actually dealing with. Um, so we came in and facilitated a design challenge around uh, our output actually was developing like a memorandum of understanding so that they had some shared language around what their partnerships would be going forward. And then the final one. Oh yeah. Yeah. So that was like different time points in their engagement, um, and so the popsicle sticks were like different actions that they would take. I'm not actually sure what the slinky was for at that time. Um, <laughs> it's a good question. I'm not sure. Uh, and so kind of that last phase between group dynamics. So the illustrative example for this in December, we hosted a weekend long uh, design challenge that was bringing together unsheltered folks in Oakland and city councilors, city staff members, and residents in Oakland to try to mutually address issues of homelessness in District 3, uh, which is the West Oakland District. And this was a super interesting project because we were actually approached to do it by the Oakland District 3 city councilwoman. Um, learned a lot about local politics in the process, um, but it had us going through like a six month long process of starting to build trust with unsheltered folks, understanding why they didn't trust the Oakland city government, and they had lots of reasons not to trust Oakland city government, um, what kind of the most immediate needs they were facing and what they would want to see the design of some new solutions around. And so at the event, there was everything from like the very tactical, how do we winterize our tents so that we can survive on the streets in the winter, up to like how do we create uh, better transitional housing as we're working between encampments and single residency occupancies. Um, and so our, our role was really just in facilitating that process of unsheltered folks teaming up with 
residents and trying to mutually come up with solutions. Yeah. Can we go back two slides? Thank you. The healing, the healing. Yes. Oh. Uh, for that one. So to, to play devil's advocate here, since you're interested in the politics of expertise, uh, if, if, if I hear you presenting this particular experience, and I happen to be an expert trauma uh, counselor or psychologist, I'd probably say, wait a minute, what, what are you doing? You have no expertise in dealing with people in trauma. Yep. This is totally irresponsible. Mm -hmm. And uh, right? And then I will throw my credentials in front of you and say, you have no business dealing with, with, with these issues. Totally. I wonder, how do you guys deal with that? Sure. Stuff? Totally, and that's that's a good um, kind of remark on the ways, the problems that like design can solve and some of the work that other folks are doing. Um, this work was actually inspired by the two of our Reflux folks who had a background in public health and had a specific framing on trauma-informed healthcare. Um, so it was a bit coming from their educational experiences. Granted, they were fresh graduates, so they hadn't had, you know, 20 years of experience working in trauma-informed care. Um, the other thing that we tried to be super careful about was not proposing any particular solutions to their trauma and allowing it to be a self-guided process of them knowing what's best for themselves and also not saying that this is the only thing that would heal their trauma. Um, so the framing of up front of it certainly um, was trying to be very intentional about this is not going to like solve everything but it was an attempt to start to build creative agency to work on healing trauma that the participants may or may not have been dealing with. So you, you haven't experienced actual pushback from expert groups in, in any of the three examples that you share with us? Um, I mean, on this one, we've only, you know, this is the only example of the time that we've done it. We're actually, like, writing a paper right now to, to get some of that, like, peer-reviewed expert pushback on it so we can um, reframe our ideas. On the other two, I mean, the most pushback that we got on the Oakland homelessness example was just that folks didn't want to engage, the homeless folks didn't want to engage with not homeless folks. They were like, nah, like, they're not going to care about us. I'm not going to try to build empathy for them if they're not going to build empathy for us, mm -hmm. um, which is why we took so long up front to try to get some buy-in from folks to want to come. Um, and even then, it was a bit of a self-selecting group who actually showed up to the event. But yeah, not, not from, like, an expert, like, traditional academic expert, but we also haven't necessarily pushed these out in academic spaces. Uh, whoops. Yeah, so kind of summary of motivation of this group is that if I already said you can't solve inequity problems without thinking of ec equity. You can't solve political problems without thinking about political problem, political context as well. And so where we struggle with thinking and acting diplomatically and politically, we're trying to use like two different types of vocabulary, the vocabulary of designers and the vocabulary of folks working in equity. Um, an example of how that's come up is we're in the Bay Area, we're right next to Silicon Valley, and so we talk about design for equity. And some of the um, venture capitalists who have overheard that, they're like, do you mean equity like in your company? Like, are you talking monetary <laughs> equity? No, 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 social equity. So being very aware that there are very different <laughs> vocabularies that different people have. Um, the other idea is that political problems are complex and are wicked, um, and navigating in the design of that has to be super intentional, and we really have to be practicing what we preach here. Um, whoops. And there aren't strong examples of precedent of other folks who are really doing this like on a large scale, not the same way that there is of folks doing human-centered design work, or of folks doing activism work. The intersection there is, is being built kind of as we speak. And so how we're working to overcome that, paying very close attention to the words we use and the words that our design peers use and our equity peers use, and trying when possible to define what we mean by certain things. But you know, stuff comes up. So just being kind of very humble and candid about this is where we're coming from has been the biggest boon, I think, to our success. Um, I, I like this idea that design helps make complex problems into complicated problems. 
So it's wading through some of that morass of here's all the crap that's going on in my brain, but I'm gonna apply my design tactics to help me at least understand a direction forward so I can start to, to move the needle on, on trying to address it. Uh, and then we're currently working to build a network of other folks who are working in equity design. Uh, and so what that looks like, uh, I didn't have time to put this on a map, but we're part of a group of six or five other organizations that are in Orlando, St. Louis, uh, Palo Alto, Oakland, that are also considering what is equity design. Um, and so I'm happy to connect if any of that looks interesting. I have contact information for all of them, um, but all great folks all thinking about similar types of stuff. Uh, and so that kind of takeaway framework, I guess, abstracting out from lessons I've learned. Learn the vocabulary and try to empathize with the people that you're working with. Um, so practice empathy not only in the design spaces, but also in the ways that you're approaching design. Um, try to understand the political and diplomatic context of the problem you're working in and iterate through that. You're never going to understand it all at once, so keep checking back in also, like, politics change, you know? Maybe they don't change, you know, every day, but they certainly change every four years. They certainly change with every election. But I'm also talking about, like, the more localized, not necessarily electoral politics, just the different interactions that we have with governments and with each other in uh, the social systems that we live in. And then finally, find your kindred spirits um, and try to draw strength in numbers. So what are other folks doing? How can you work with them? How can you learn from them? And try to build up each other while also being very critical and critiquing each other. So critical friends is the way someone just posted to me. You'll hold the ladder as they're climbing it, but you'll also maybe tell them when their ladder is in the wrong place. Uh, so to answer those three questions that I pose, human-centered design helps us solve problems, but on its own, it doesn't address wicked problems. So we need to embed equity into human-centered design by engaging in co-design and by thinking and acting diplomatically. And that is all I have, right on time. <laughs> Thank you. So it is um, just, yeah, it's 6 o'clock here. So other questions? Um, and I think at this point also, if you have to leave, please feel free to go. There are snacks on the other side of that bookshelf turns out. Um, they weren't super accessible, which is why I'm so hungry. But yeah, questions real quick, but then of course feel free to go and uh, Julia can hang out for a little bit here and have some more informal conversation as well. Any questions real quick? Or do you have here? Advice you're looking for? I was super clear all the way through. Yeah. So yeah. what do you feel about yourself if you didn't do co-design in the beginning of your project, like, I I think the same thing about the things I've worked on, like, oh shit, I didn't do that. Like, yeah. I just, I get really upset about myself. Like, yeah. I don't know, but how do you work through that process and you say, like, with the people you're working with, like, guys, I figured this out, we got to step back five steps, yeah. or how do you start to manage uh, when new education and new thoughts come to you halfway through a project or at the end? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, first I feel really terrible <laughs> that I, like, messed that up. Um, but I think I, I appreciate the intro Greg gave me because it's, I guess I consider it to just be a learning process. Like, yeah, that was really bad, but there's no way that I can change the past. The best I can do is start to repair some of that damage I've done going forward. Um, so trying to understand why what I did wasn't the best um, but why it happened so that I can try to make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, which is obviously not like a fun thing to be thinking about, but it's been the most important thing of understanding why is co-design necessary. And it was only in learning about co-design that I was like, yeah, this is great. And then I was like, wait, yeah, I haven't done any of that. Um, and so better late than never, I guess. Yeah. So then what do you... Uh, talk to students and other people that are now thinking oh, I'm about to graduate I want to try to do this but I don't know if I feel fully ready for co-design we Greg didn't even teach us that like Damn what's it, going Greg. on <laughs> you know, like, uh -huh. 
<laughs> so am I ready to go try to attack? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Am I ready to go start really tackling the problems? <laughs> yeah. but, I mean, a lot of people come out of like, I feel really pessimistic that like, yeah. I'm not prepared. Engineers really suck at this stuff because, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're always working to fix that, but should you go for it, right? You know, yes, it's it's good to learn from these problems. At the yeah. same time, we got to be careful failing. Yeah, exactly. At the same time. So no, and, and give it's, to students. I, I like hear the contradiction and kind of what I'm saying, but um, finding people who are different than you who can start to fill in some of those biases is like an immediate thing that we can do right now. Um, the other people will help us see when what you're doing is problematic or when what you're doing is super cool and you should keep doing it. Um, and then trying to actually work with those people. So like me working with public health students or working with city planners, um, that was not something, yeah, I graduated thinking like, oh, I have no idea how I'm gonna go do this. But the short answer is I'm, I'm not doing it alone. Um, so really trying to find those people who are also doing the work too and trying to build each other up in like a symbiotic process. I know it sounds super idealistic. I can like hear it as I'm saying it. Um, but I don't know if I'm nope. answering your questions nope. at all. Surround okay. yourself by people that will help you succeed. Yeah. My favorite uh, television quote is from Leslie Nope in Parks and Rec, and she leaves off by saying, find your team and get to work. Um, that'll be the tattoo on my back. <laughs> Just like that idea of like, find your critical friends, find the people who support you and who love you and who want to see you succeed and are going to make sure that you're succeeding in the best possible way. Yeah. Um, so, for your work with Reflex, when you're doing things like between two different stakeholder groups, yeah. is one of the goals like to make it a sustainable relationship and like something that's not just like one workshop? And then how do you try to accomplish that? Yeah, I mean, that's another like the framing of how we're engaging is also itself like a politically fraught issue, especially with Oakland city government. You know, we wrote out a contract for what we would be doing and they wanted it to be a one-off, you're doing a weekend, that's it. And we were kind of like, no, no, like that's not how it works. But there's some negotiation of what they're willing to pay us to do. You know, we have livelihoods, we have to sustain ourselves, but what we also believe needs to be done. And so we went a little bit above and beyond of like doing that pre-work but we haven't had the resources to continue kind of fostering those partnerships that were made. But we have continued to stay involved in the homeless advocacy work going on in Oakland, even though right now we're not working within that space explicitly, but at least just kind of staying involved in um, letting them know that we're, we didn't just leave, you know, or we still care and we're still here. Um, but it is a negotiation and a compromise. Yeah, one. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> you have a question? Go ahead. Uh, yeah. yeah, please. There was another um, lecture today. A student, an alumni, a mind's alumni came back. Um, she's doing grad school at Virginia Tech in engineering education, and she nice. was just talking about um, how she got through undergrad with all of these technical classes and courses, and then she's at the end of her undergrad, and she's like, that's it. That's all I can do, and kind of... Um, looking at these unexplored spaces in engineering where you don't really see the application of engineering in politics and in mm -hmm. social justice and then you kind of, uh, this is what I'm going through now, you're, your eyes are kind of open to all of these things where you can apply yep. um, your technical your technical skills but also totally. your passion and understanding of the need for, for social change. Yeah. Um, but I feel so just unequipped to participate yeah. in, in that kind of space. Yeah, and I think that's similar to the question he asked yeah. up front. I mean, in my the the way I dealt with it is, you know, not for everyone. I went to grad school. <laughs> yeah. I, I took five more years to try to figure it out a bit more, which worked for me because I knew that I needed that structured learning environment, mm -hmm. and I didn't necessarily trust myself to seek out edu educational opportunities on my own. Um, but I do think, like, the, the further I'm getting in grad school, the more I'm seeing that these problems replicate in the professional world, in the academic world, in the political world. Um, so while I'm trying to figure it out in the academic space, I'm more and more realizing like I could have figured it out um, by following some similar tactics in the professional world of finding people who are working on cool things with different companies um, 
Dude, talking with activists has been like the best part about living in Oakland, um, which is like home to the Black Panther Party, home of free speech, all kinds of cool stuff. So talking actually with folks who are community organizing on the ground and trying to say like, I'm an engineer, but it's not necessarily what you think that means, or at least that's not the type of engineer I want to be. Um, yeah, so I think, I think similar tactics apply, but I will acknowledge that my bias is certainly towards my experience in the academic space. But yeah, if you're passionate about it and if you're humble enough to like keep checking yourself and to find people who will check you too, then there's, that's like the best possible thing you can do, I think. add something quickly to Please. that. Um, if you're really interested in human-centered design and, and the concepts that Julia's been talking about, um, I think it's IDEO and Acumen yeah. that offer like a brilliant short online course that you can do where you choose mm -hmm. a particular social issue and you work through with a group uh, using human-centered design methodology. You work through a solution. So I think it's just a really great way to kind of just dip your toe in the water and see if it's something you want to explore further. Totally, yeah. Yeah, there are lots of... Um, like great online things to mm -hmm. teach design, yeah. And also, as MOOCs are getting better, mm -hmm. I like just took a class up, well, it was more an introduction to what community organizing is that was offered for free through the University of Michigan on Coursera. So there are opportunities to learn, but a lot of it is, is very self-guided, yeah. Yeah, one. Can you go to the slide, please, with the network of organizations? That one. So uh, I wonder how much agreement consensus there is between these different organizations about what equity design actually is. Totally. And I'm glad you asked that because all six of these orgs plus a couple independent contractors who don't have logos, which is the only reason they're not included on this slide, um, we all just met up February, the first weekend of February in Oakland to talk about exactly about that. What are the different ways that we're approaching equity design? What's the language we're using around it? And the consensus we came to is that we're calling this field equity design um, with that shared understanding of kind of the things that I mentioned here of co-design and thinking politically. So, so you say that meeting just happened? Yeah. Okay. And, and was it friendly? Did you guys came out? And Super friendly. Out? Yeah, like lots of giggles. Yeah, <laughs> just like showed up in like slippers and like ready to, you know, get to work, but also really engage in like some fun and bonding. And, and the question I ask, uh, the reason I ask is because, because even though the, the, the concept equity design is very appealing and, and relatively simple, in, at least in the words, yeah. Um, in, in the humanitarian engineering, it's, it's very tricky. Mm -hmm. Many organizations, programs, uh, initiatives who claim to be doing humanitarian engineering um, do not even question or know the difference between what they're doing and just charity work yep. or just plain uncritical voluntarism. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's very frustrating yeah. for somebody who tries to you know, add or, or keep some quality yeah. uh, to, and, and, and uh, um, I don't know, um, some really meat behind the word humanitarian engineering yeah. to have everybody out there just trying to grab into the words and say, oh, we're doing that as well. Totally, yeah. And I'm, you know, that was the thing that kept coming up, like, this is not meant to be an exclusive group. It should be as inclusive as all the folks who are doing this work. But how do we kind of ensure that it isn't just a thing, a moniker that people take on to slap onto work that is almost counterproductive to the goal. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at how to, yeah, like filter, I guess, is, is the word that's coming to mind. Um, but also allowing folks who might not be doing this work, but want to be doing this work. So how do you kind of like meet people where they're at, but also retain the space so that it is a place where folks who are already doing it can learn from each other and push the practice forward. And I don't have an answer yet because we haven't tried it, but the thing that we're <coughs> going to start doing is having like intentionally um, open uh, like show and tell groups where folks who are kind of already doing this and have already engaged in it start inviting other people who they know are doing it as well and doing sort of like a referral-based system of 
those folks too who are invited, like what people do they know that are doing the work and how can we fold them into this conversation? Yeah. Let's do it. We can hang out a little while longer in the library. Thank you so much, Julia. Yeah.